G'day guys, I'm gonna make this my Q&A video number two. I did one last year and everyone got a little bit out of it, so let's see how we go with this. This question I get asked a little bit lately, and that is why don't I post up more content? Now that's twofold, so we'll touch on it in two points. The first one is the weather. I don't know if you've looked at what's been happening in the eastern side of New South Wales, Australia, where I live, but we're on about our fifth flood event in two years, and that's about five more floods than we normally get. So most of the paddocks and areas that I do hunt and shoot in are just too wet to go. Unfortunately, I can't get out as regularly as I'd like because of those access restrictions, but hopefully it dries out again soon. The second reason is YouTube burnout. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys follow some of the bigger channels and unfortunately a lot of those really effluent social media people, they just burn out and stop doing it. They get sick of it, the pressure gets too much, they find themselves going out and creating content just for the sake of creating content. Now it's one thing I've always said is I never want to go hunting to make a video. I'm happy to make a video while I go hunting, but I don't want the driver to be YouTube. I don't, I don't want that. Um, it just burns it out. It defeats the purpose and the reason for the passion to go out and hunt and shoot. If I'm just doing it solely to make videos, uh, I think that's completely the wrong message. So for me, I'll share what I can while I'm out. But unfortunately, there are things at the moment I can't share with some of the contracted shoots that I am doing. How does someone become a professional shooter? Now the last video I did, I was just wreck hunting like everyone else. Fast forward to now and I have gone down the contract vertebrate pest control business route uh, and that gives me access to things like the suppressors that I've got now uh, to be a little bit more effective in the field. Now people do wanna know how do they get into that? Uh, look, it's just a business. It's no different to anything else. Um, my first point of reference would be to check the firearms registry information in your state. I get questions on people in other states and look, all the states are different. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with those. I've got a bit of an understanding of how the system works, sometimes poorly in New South Wales. Uh, so yeah, back to the registry, check what fact sheets they have. The legislation is a good point. It's just a business. You need ABNs, insurances, all the safety docs, everything like that. How much do I get paid? Look, that's a little bit of a niggly one for me. I was always raised to not ask my father, my butcher, or my mechanic, or anyone like that, how much they earn. It's a little bit impolite. Now, I seem to get questions off strangers on the internet. Now, I know everyone's interested in what I'm doing, but sometimes those questions are a little bit blunt, and I prefer to not go down that route. What I will say is the rate is reflective of the hours that we work which is sometimes all night, so you've got to factor that in. Also the expense of the equipment that we run and the expertise that we can bring into the field to get some of these jobs done. Should we do head or chest shots on animals? That's an interesting question. It's species specific. There are certain animals under the regulations that you have to head shoot if you're doing pest control. There are others that Going for headshots does have a margin of error because certain species do move their heads around a lot when they're feeding and things like that. Uh, what I would say is chest shots are generally safer on those animals. If you're comfortable enough to take a headshot, 100% go for it. If the cartridge you're using is enough to take a chest shot on, say, a deer, um, go and do that as well. Look, I don't probably give too much guidance on that. All I would say is shoot to your comfort level. You definitely don't have to do headshots on everything and you definitely don't have to do chest shots on everything. Just be comfortable with your ability and the cartridge that you are firing. That'll lead on to cartridge selection with thermals. Now again, it completely depends on what species you're targeting, but generally for me, I like the six, six and a half millimeter, more mild cartridges. Now, what I mean by that is, and a lot of people might not understand, Thermal scopes, not all thermal scopes, but most thermal scopes have limited eye relief, down to sort of 35 to 50 millimetres. Now, if you compare that to a glass scope that might have 80 to 100 millimetres, it's very easy to scope yourself with a thermal. So I certainly wouldn't be comfortable putting a thermal scope on some of the larger cartridges um, just because of that factor. If you're comfortable with that, go right ahead. Uh, but for me, Back again, I like the six, six and a half mil cartridges. Uh, they give me good versatility. Up and down for sort of smaller game, yeah, it's gonna go splat, but uh, I'm not too concerned about that. Up to some of the bigger things like pigs and deer and still be really ethical. 
Yes, I know on that one, I shoot a 308 with a thermal on it, but my rifle is an absolute pig of a thing to carry around. It's really heavy, and that's another factor that comes into recoil management. If you've got a hugely heavy rifle, you can probably put a thermal on it, and it's not going to kick as much as a light rifle in a smaller cartridge. There's some really good calculators for recoil on the internet. I'd recommend that you go and have a look at some of those if you're on the fence what to run in that aspect, but uh, yeah, the other thing is now I'm shooting with a suppressor. My 308 kicks about like a 223. So um, that's definitely a fact that's really pleasant to fire now. Uh, and one thing I'm doing in the future is building up a lighter 308 that's a bit better on my shoulder to carry around at night. Does a muzzle brake or suppressor change point of impact? Absolutely they do. When you put something on the end of your barrel, it changes the harmonics. So when you fire a bullet, the barrel goes like that very smallly, uh, a lot of times in the window of time it takes for that bullet to go from the cartridge and exit the muzzle. So when you put something on the end, that changes how it vibrates a little bit and that does tie into where your point of impact will be. That'll lead on to the next question and that is, what's my reload data? Now, I'm generally not comfortable to share that. It can be unsafe. The ammunition that I do reload for my rifles is worked up. Now, while I don't generally shoot maximum pressure, it can be unsafe to put it in another rifle because all chambers are a little bit different. The other side to reloads is accuracy. Now, that's a big thing for me. Back to the harmonics that we talked about before, the ammunition developed in my rifle shoots the harmonics of my barrel. Now, that doesn't mean you can go out and buy exactly the same gun and it will have the same harmonics. It might not. You've only got to change the stock of a rifle harmonics will change, uh, how it's manufactured, there's different tensions in the steel and things like that. So um, I'd recommend if you do want to reload, work up those pressures. A chronograph can be really handy to find those um, speed nodes where the accurate point of the ammunition will be consistent. Uh, that's definitely something to look into. I'll probably do a really poor job of explaining that. If I try to, maybe that will be a future video, but we'll see how we go. KFC, Zinger or Original Recipe? Now, I'm all for equity and all of that bullshit, but I'll put it straight. If you come out in the paddock with me and you bring Zinger KFC, I'm going to leave you out there. It's bloody garbage, original recipe, or get the F out. Using thermal is not hunting. That's a repetitive comment that I do get on the videos by the high and mighty that think that they are superior beings. Well, guess what? I don't really care what you think. Um, I use thermal because it's a very effective pest control tool. Uh, I know there are fundamentals of hunting that are applied, like noise, wind, and if it's really bright moonlight, you do have to watch out with skylines and becoming exposed. But again, it is pest control shooting. It's a really effective tool for that. If people think that I'm out there shooting, you know, trophy deer at one o'clock in the morning and pegging them up on the wall, um, I don't, if that's your thing, that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. But again, I don't really know why people come and try and pick on my videos um, and make that claim at me. Again, I don't really care what you think. Uh, that's your opinion. Let's keep it that way. Should you wear camo clothing at night when hunting with thermal? Look, generally I do. Uh, a bit of a believer that it does help break your outline up, especially if the moon's really bright and you're in some of those more open paddocks. One of the other aspects I'd use that clothing for is most of my hunting clothing is more technical. It might be sort of micro grid fleece or layered for wind or obviously rain gear. Um, and it costs a lot of money. So I'd rather use it instead of just buying other non camo gear to use at night. Uh, I've spent the money on it, might as well run it. Shooting supported, so running a tripod versus say quad sticks. For me, generally I'll run quad sticks if I'm shooting rabbits or animals that don't track left to right uh, as they close in or run around. So fox whistling, I don't hugely enjoy the quad sticks because they are a little bit poor for tracking those moving targets. That's really where a tripod comes in because you've got that basically camera ball head on the top so it's really easy to pan your gun around, um, shooting pigs and stuff like that. Mickey Mouse uh, off the tripod. Quad sticks are really good for rabbits and things like that that are a little bit more static when we do shoot at them. They give you a really good rest because they're two points of contact as opposed to a tripod that's just one. Uh, either one though gives you a really steady rest to shoot on when you're standing in those open paddocks and I wouldn't not use one given the choice. As a pest control shooter, why don't I have a semi-automatic? That's an interesting one. The main aspect for me 
is expense. Uh, basically to go down the Cat D path at the moment, I need to buy a whole new storage safe. Those guys aren't cheap for Cat D level storage. Uh, they're around three, three and a half grand. And then to buy a good quality Australian made uh, semi-automatic 308, like a Wedgetail WT25, they're about six and a half grand. So it's around a $10,000 investment to go down the semi-auto route. Doesn't mean I won't, it's certainly something I'm looking at, especially with all the bulk pig shooting. Uh, but since I've become a professional pest control shooter and I've gone down the suppressor route, that's a big enough outlay in itself just to get those devices. So uh, semi-auto might come, but it'll be down the track when I've worked through a few other aspects that I do need to buy. How to move closer to animals using thermal or night vision when it's pitch black and you can't see. That's a really simple one. I just use a little red LED headlight. It's just bright enough to let me see where I walk. Uh, it might shine three, maybe five meters in front of me when it's pitch black. It stops me from falling in wombat holes and things like that. Yes, I have fallen in a few holes when I'm trying to walk around at night. Generally with that dull, broad red LED headlight, animals don't tend to notice it until you get to within like 20 meters, which is pretty close. So uh, all the pigs and stuff we walk in on, fox shooting, dogs, I've always got the red headlight on so I can see where I'm walking, how my rifle mounts up on the tripod, uh, reloading, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I'd rather risk running the red light opposed to not using it and banging something or making an obtrusive noise. Um, that's definitely worse than that little dull red headlight. Um, again, as you are walking into animals at night, the big aspects wind, if you get that wrong, the hunt's all over. Righto guys, I hope there's been a few little pointers or snippets of information in there that you do find helpful. Uh, just one note, last time I did a Q&A video, I brought my little boy down with me. Uh, he was very helpful, he sat behind the camera and pointed a stick at my head like that from the other side. So uh, he got the flick today, he did want to come and he said, I'm going to poke a stick at you again. He thought it was that funny, so did his mother. So uh, yeah, they're not here. Anyway, I'll see everyone next time.